Hi everyone and welcome back to another GPU buying guide. This time it's for the RTX 3050, which at the moment is the cheapest ray tracing capable GPU from Nvidia, which might make it a very interesting option for a lot of people. Anyways, before that, a short explanation on what the purpose of my buying guides are. I aim to inform people on which GPU models have better configured hardware and BIOSes. As I always say, it is true that all the RTX 3050 or whatever card I'm discussing should perform similarly within a few percent of each other at default settings, regardless of the hardware and BIOS configurations. It's not gonna magically make your RTX 3060 perform like a 3070 or a 3050 like a 3060. So don't use this buying guide to expect way better performance by buying the higher tier cards. Especially more so with the RTX 3050 since it has a smaller low powered GPU that benefits way less from power delivery and cooling improvements. However, if you have the option to buy a selection of different models, there is no reason not to pick the one with the best cooler, VRM, BIOSes, and build quality, as long as the price is not way too expensive for the ones with the better hardware. I always emphasize on the power limits, cooling, and VRMs as the most important, because the new GPUs these days can boost their clock speeds as high as they can as long as there's enough power and temperature headroom, which makes the boost clock specifications pretty much useless. So the factor that actually affects performance in real life is the power limits and the cooling performance of the cards. This is why Nvidia now makes brands list TGP or power limit specifications for the laptop GPUs, because it really does matter a lot in terms of performance. And this is also why I am quite annoyed that they don't list the TGP on the box of desktop GPUs, where different models from different brands might set wildly varying TGPs that affect the performance even if it uses the same GPU. Fortunately, the power limits can be checked on the BIOS files, which are available on Tech Power Up's GPU BIOS database, as long as someone has uploaded it using GPU-Z. Which is why if you buy a GPU, please download GPU-Z and upload your BIOS file as that'll help me and others when comparing different GPU models by seeing the BIOS files themselves. Now for cooling performance, it is also just as important, as the boost algorithm automatically boosts the clock speeds higher the cooler the GPU is. Not to mention better coolers will usually mean lower noise levels and therefore a better user experience. Also important are the VRMs, which is the circuitry that provides the operating voltage to the GPU and the memory of the GPU. But for the memory, they're pretty much always not really important, so we're just gonna focus on the GPU VRMs for these types of comparisons. The VRM's current capabilities are very important for anyone that wants to overclock, especially if it involves shorting the power monitoring shunts that remove the power limits completely by fooling the power circuitry that it's drawing less power, usually called shunt mods. But for people who don't overclock, a stronger VRM will mean it'll be stressed less and will run cooler, which should last longer with all things equal. Now before we start, the Gigabyte Aorus card has a question mark on its name, because I literally cannot find any information on this, except from Gigabyte's website, which is really leaving a lot to be desired. So this is mostly speculation by me based on their lesser gaming OC variant. So let's start with the power limits, or TGP, total graphics power, which for the RTX 3050 actually stays at the same 130 watts for all but Palette and Gainworks cards at 140 watts and Asus Strix OC at 150 watts. Which is nice to see an increased wattage, but in real world usage, you probably won't be able to tell the difference at all. This is because the RTX 3050 is a low power GPU, and the 130 watt default specification is really plenty enough for it already, as can be seen with how all the cards maintain their maximum clock speeds in these graphs. Actually, even for the maximum power limits, you can see that most of the cards don't allow any increases at all or very small amounts up to 150 watts or even less than that. These power limit differences are so small, you're unlikely to see any meaningful benefit at all. You will likely get more performance variations between cards of the same model due to the individual chip's silicon quality. The only cards with elevated maximum power limits are the Gigabyte Gaming OC, Aorus Elite, Asus Strix cards, and the colorful Ultra W. The power limits are really not a point to make a buying decision on. But the higher power limit cards are usually set up as such because the manufacturers put stronger VRMs on these cards, which is the next point I'm going to talk about. First off, to give some perspective, the RTX 3050 at 130 watts TGP runs at about 1.075 volts, 
pretty much at the top end of the voltage that NVIDIA allows on Ampere GPUs at default, which means calculating using the equation current equals power divided by voltage at about 1.075 volts, it'll draw around 120 amps, which is very low compared to the higher end NVIDIA GPUs. Also considering this is a small GA106 GPU, with only a few of the cores enabled as well, there are not a lot of power spikes to be concerned with, unlike the larger GPUs. As an example, the MSI RTX 3050 Gaming X shows power spikes up to 201 watts and the Palette Dual OC at 231 watts in short 1 millisecond bursts, according to Iger's lab reviews. This would equal 187 amps of current for the MSI card and 215 amps of current for the Palette card. Now you may be concerned that this is higher than the lowest end cards VRMs rated at only 200 amps. But the ratings are for continuous loads and these spikes are very brief at only 1 milliseconds. Combined with the fact that this is a smaller GPU that doesn't spike as often as the bigger GPUs, this is likely calculated by Nvidia as sufficient for a reference specification especially to reduce manufacturing costs as much as possible for such a low-budget GPU. But if you want to feel extra safe and have peace of mind, then for sure you can just go for the cards with 220 amp rated VRMs at least. Then there are the cards with 240 to 250 amp VRMs, which are achieved using stronger 60 amp power stages or in the case of the colorful and MSI cards, using one extra VRM phase. For these cards, I would feel safer overclocking them with shunt mods that remove the power limit. There is also the Gigabyte Gaming OC card with a stronger 275 amp VRM by using slightly stronger 55 amp power stages in 5 phases. But as you'll see later, the cooler is kinda garbage, making the strong VRM pretty useless if you want to overclock it. The high-end cards are Asus Trix cards, the colorful Ultra WOC, and the Gigabyte Aorus Elite, which I am speculating the VRMs off due to lack of information, but it is probably not worse than the Gigabyte Gaming OC. These stronger VRM cards are using VRMs more complex and therefore expensive for a simple GPU like the RTX 3050. So unless you intend on extreme overclocking with voltage mods and shunt mods, do not feel like you'll need to purchase these based on their VRMs. The lower end cards are perfectly adequate for an RTX 3050. Now for the cooling performance of the different cards, it is impossible to find performance results on every model as not every one of them gets reviewed. But I did gather the performance results measured by Guru3D, TechPowerUp, and Hardware Lux, who seems to do some of the most consistent and thorough GP reviews most of the time. I combined the results of the first three reviewers by correcting the temperatures to TechPowerUp's results as they had the most GPUs tested. I did this by calculating the average delta temperature and noise measured on the same cards that TechPowerUp tested and corrected any card that isn't tested with that, which results in this combined graph. In this graph, we can clearly see the ASUS Trix is definitely the winner here, even with its higher 150W TGP, thanks to its overkill cooler taken from the RTX 3060 version. It really is quite hilarious seeing how much better it is than the rest. Then the EVGA XC Black, Inno 3D Twin X2 OC, MSI Gaming X, and Pallet Dual OC performs pretty similarly as well. These performance are all thanks to a well-designed cooler with a proper contact area that has a actual base to spread the heat into the heat pipes which then carry the heat to vertically oriented heatsink fins that flows air better than horizontal fins. These coolers are really just a cost-optimized version of their RTX 3060 coolers while still maintaining the solid performance. Can I just say that, it is kinda hilarious how MSI is now actually using a proper contact base plate on their cheaper RTX 3050 and an actual metal backplate on their RTX 3050 as well, while their more expensive RTX 3080 Gaming X was using crappy direct contact heat pipes and a plastic backplate. Those cards were kinda terrible for RTX 3080 and it shows that people were not happy about those decisions and their sales were less than expected, which I think prompted them to improve things like you can see with this RTX 3050. So keep on choosing with your wallet and yeah, don't buy crappy cards. Now then, getting back on track, the Zota card seemingly trades temperatures for lower fan noise, which is pretty good to see considering that below 70 degrees Celsius is already pretty good temperatures. The Asus Dual is just a smaller card than the other dual fan cards, so it does make sense that it is performing slightly warmer and slightly worse overall. 
What doesn't make sense is the Gigabyte Gaming OC card. This is a triple fan design that is way longer than the other dual fan cards. In fact, it is the same size as their RTX 3060 Ti and 3070 cards and uses the same three fans. But Gigabyte has really, really, really downcosted the cooler so much while trying to keep the three fans for, I would only presume, marketing purposes, not actual function. Since, as you can see, this cooler only has two direct contact heat pipes on such a large heatsink area that is also horizontally oriented. This is cheaper to make and easier to make, which is why they use this heatsink orientation. But this creates a lot of issues. The first is that the contact for the GPU core is severely compromised, with parts of the GPU not touching the heat pipes and parts of it not touching anything at all, due to the gaps created by the heat pipes. Then the farthest parts of the heatsink fins are effectively doing absolutely nothing since they are so far away from the heat pipe or even the GPU itself. And the middle fan is effectively not doing anything at all except for adding noise due to the horizontal fins just causing the outer fans to work against it. This is just a really terrible design and I would avoid it simply because of the shitty cooler design. Yes, I actually said it. It is actually complete and utter crap compared to the other cars I've seen before. Actually, as you can see, even Gigabyte's Dual Fan Eagle card, the worst Dual Fan card, is much quieter while only being 2 degrees hotter. So, I don't know what to say, but do not get fooled by the Triple Fan Cooler on the Gaming OC. It seems to be worse or just the same as their own crappy Dual Fan card. I almost forgot I wasn't making a Gigabyte rant video for a sec there. But lastly, you have the Pallet Stormax card at the bottom, which is fine considering it is only a single fan cooler. And get this, it is still way quieter than Gigabyte's gaming OC. Probably because it has a properly designed cooler with actually 4 heat pipes. Can you imagine that? A smaller cooler has twice as many heat pipes as Gigabyte's way larger cooler. So that makes no sense at all and just don't buy the Gigabyte cards if you can't avoid it. Now for the rest of the cards, which don't really have any reviews on them, I have made this cooling performance tier list as usual. This is to be taken with a grain of salt as these are just observations I made considering many factors, such as the type of heat pipes, heatsink size, number and size of fans, and the cooling performance of said heatsink model used in a different GPU if they have been reviewed before. But this tier list should still serve pretty well to determine how a card's cooler performs roughly to a different one. Just don't make it out as a fully accurate tier list but Considering more of like, if it's in the same class, it'll probably perform pretty similarly. For the RTX 3050, the GPU is pretty easily cooled, so there are only small performance differences between the cooler designs in the same class. And also why there are only 3 tiers that I can really actually differentiate between the cards. First are the A tier cards, which are overkill triple fan cooler cards. These cards are likely very overpriced though, except for the maybe colorful NB Battle Axe EXV, which is Colorful's more budget offering but still having a well-designed triple fan cooler. Next there are the B tier cards which are good dual fan coolers. These cards mostly perform similarly to each other in terms of cooling performance so I really wouldn't sweat over which one of these has better coolers especially since they all seem to be well designed. Then there are the C tier cards which are still more than adequate as can be seen from the performance of the Palette Storm X card but these are still single fan coolers that perform worse than the better dual fan coolers for sure. There's nothing wrong with getting these, especially if these are cheaper than you can find, or you need the smaller size of the single fan cooler. The only real exception in this tier are the Gigabyte cards, which again are seriously underperforming and performing similarly to single fan coolers, despite having dual fans or even their triple fans. The Gigabyte cards just seem to try and make people buy them by using their good reputation on their higher end cards and also making them seem powerful by using triple fans in the case of the gaming OC. So to me these are pretty downright insulting designs as they just seem to be designed to mislead consumers while trying to be as cheap as possible. Lastly, let's put the cards into a tier list, with the cards also being ranked from best to worst. I factor in all the pros and cons of each card to place them above or below another card. This is really just my personal opinion on the different models of the same GPUs. So you can also interpret this as I would always pick a higher tier cards over a lower tier one if I were to buy one myself. At the top of the list would be the A tier cards, with the ASUS Strix cards at the top along with the colorful WOC and the NB EXV Battle Axe card from Colorful. 
Now for the Gigabyte Eorus Elite, it does seem to have a huge cooler that has proper vertical fins and should have better VRMs and power limits than the Gaming OC. So it should be not terrible like the Gaming OC and Eagle OC cards. But you'll never know, so maybe wait till there are actual reviews of these before buying the Gigabyte Eorus cards. Or don't buy them at all because they're bound to be pretty expensive being the A tier cards. Next are the B tier cards, which are again pretty similar in the performance and overall build quality, similar to how they stack up in cooling performance, which is that they are mostly, again, very similar, and you really couldn't go wrong with buying any of these. In fact, I would actually avoid the A tier cards altogether and buy the B tier cards at the most, as the RTX 3050 is supposed to be an affordable GPU, and the A tier cards will only be overpriced and make no sense for such a GPU. You might as well go for an RTX 3060. In the B tier, the MSI gaming cards would be at the top thanks to its overall great VRM, cooler, and build quality. The BIOS is also, well, pretty similar with all of them so that doesn't really matter too much. Then the EVGA XC cards should be commended for their great cooling performance while staying in a dual slot form factor. These cards are really well designed and should be at the top of your list for RTX 3050 purchases. Next are the PALET, GameWord, and PNY cards which are all the same exact hardware. With the Palette Dual OC and Gainward Ghost OC having slightly higher power limits in the BIOS. These are still better than Inno 3D cards, which, while having well designed coolers, still uses Inno 3D's typical minimum spec VRMs and also unadjustable power limits at all. Then there are the Zotac cards, which seem like they're basically the same thing hardware wise, so I wouldn't really go out of my way trying to get their Amp Edition, which traditionally would be the better version, but in this case, they seem to be exactly the same cards. The Asus Dual, MSI Ventus 2X, Colorful Dual Cards, and the Galax EX Cards are all still good dual fan cards that I wouldn't mind buying as well. Lastly, we have the C-tier cards, where I will put the Gigabyte Gaming OC and Eagle cards at the top, simply because they're still somewhat better than the rest of the cards in this tier, but again, as I have explained in the cooling section of this video, these have really insultingly bad cooling performance for the size and number of fans that they have. Do not be fooled by the triple fan, gaming OC, or the large eagle cards, as they really have terrible heatsink designs that seem like they're designed to mislead consumers to think that they perform better than they do, with the you know increased number of fans and also the larger fans, but they really don't. Combined with how these cards are usually priced above the other cards in the C tier, I would definitely avoid buying these gigabyte cards at all. Just don't. The designs are really, really bad for the coolers. The rest of the C tier cards are just boring single fan cards that will still perform adequately as an RTX 3050, and it, they don't really have any major flaws, so I wouldn't really mind buying any of them. Now the final word of advice, for the RTX 3050, please really buy whatever card is cheapest that you can find, since the RTX 3050 is meant to be a lower budget class GPU. It doesn't make sense to splurge on the extra money on higher tier cards. So I would use this GPU buying guide to choose the highest rank cards of whatever lowest price options you can buy. Don't purposely go for the A tier cards simply because it's better, because that doesn't make sense for an RTX 3050. If you go for the A tier cards, you're gonna probably start to spend as much money as buying a cheap RTX 3060, which you should just buy those instead. But yeah, that's it for this video. I hope I helped you pick an RTX 3050 and that you learned something useful from this video. Leave a comment down below if you have any questions. Leave a like if you like this video and subscribe if you want to see more of buying guides like this. As always, thanks for watching.